Mishnah my friends up to chapter 5 verse 1 and by Daber Adonai Moshe more God spoke to Moshe saying Tzavetz B'nai Israel, command the children of Israel and send away from each camp called Tzaruah v'kol Zav kol Tamehu Nefesh send away from every camp oh well we did this first Rashi yesterday we did Correct. this Rashi we left off with the woman and you said they go to Everybody goes when right. they get their period to the outside. Again. Right. We're up to, we did the first round. How long do they have to sneak? The, to, to the, until they're no longer Tame. Well, okay. So they have to go to the mikvah. And what, how long does the man have to stay there? Until he, it depends. The man is, if he is a, a Zav, if he is a, a major Zav, then he's Tame for seven days. But uh, if he I just, don't know what that means. meaning to say, if he has this emission three times within two days of what the emission of is up, then he's Tame for seven days. So, and then he has to go to the Mecca and bring a Korban. Ah. So, then the uh, the we're up to the Rashi, it says, Tame o Nefesh, call Tame o Nefesh, Tame o Nefesh, the Misav, the Mitme, the Mitme, Nafsha, the Incha. Uncle says this that he is impure by the bones of a human soul. Omar Anishu Washun Atmos Adam. I say it's a, it's an expression of the bones of a man. Washun Arami in Aramaic. Barbeyesh. Uh, many examples of this Aramaic word, right? She says, Adrianos Shechik Tamia Shechik Atzamos. Adrian may his bones be ground up. Okay, so. So this is what it says, from the male until the female, you send them out to outside the camp, so that they do not make their camps tamei, that I'm dwelling within them. And the children of Israel did this, they sent them outside the camp, just like God spoke to Moshe, King Asub and Israel. This is what the children of Israel did. And God spoke to Moshe, saying, A man or a woman who does any one of the sins. So this is the sin of what's called Mi'iwa. Mi'iwa is the sin of misappropriation of the temple funds. Uh, let me just give it to you. That if you accidentally misappropriate temple funds, you have to bring an asham, a guilt offering. If you do it intentionally, you get kares. But you were talking about accidentally. So what's going on here? So Rashi says, he committed a trespass against Hashem. Hare Chazar, the cause of Khan, Parshas goes El Venishba al Shekhar. The Torah is repeating here the prohibition of one who steals and then swears falsely about his theft. Hiya Mura the Parashava Yikra. This is the this is the sin, which is so here we're talking about an Asham Gezela, not, Ash, not Mi'iwa, we're talking about Asham Gezela. This is the idea of somebody who steals, who steals something and then swears falsely and denies that he stole it. This was talked about in, in Vayikra. He committed this trespass and he, was, and he lied to his friend about it. So why is it repeated here, even though it was said in Vayikra? Rashi tells us, it's written that they shall confess. So it's to tell us that he doesn't pay a fifth plus the principal and to bring a guilt offering. And he doesn't do it until he confesses. He doesn't do it in, until he confesses. That's what's telling us. And the second thing is telling us that if somebody steals from a convert, uh, um, and then the person and dies, so who is he going to give it to? He has to give it to the Kohen. So somebody has a monetary claim against them, and you swear falsely, you pay the principal, plus one-fifth to the person whom he sinned against. 
But if the one whom he sinned against has died, then generally speaking, you pay it to the heirs. But, but if the person converted, then, and they don't have any children or they didn't marry and they have no heirs. So who do you give that money to? So you give that money to the Kohen. The Kohen gets the windfall then. The Kohen gets the windfall. You're saying if he converted, then it would go to the heirs by the truth, the fact that the heirs are not Jewish? Yeah, a, a convert, if he has no children subsequent or a spouse subsequent to the conversion, it's considered like he's a newborn person and he has no uh, relatives. So therefore, who do you give the money to? You give it to him, you give it to the coin. Don't give it to the, the his pre-conversion family. That's what the Torah is saying. So... That raises a, a totally different question, but can I just quickly ask you because that was always on my mind. If you convert and your parent dies, do you sit shit up for them? So you certainly can. Uh, you're not required to, but you can. You have the option to. Most people I, I, I know have converted have sat shit for them, but you're not required to, but you're not prohibited from. So just to point out, when the, you pay the one-fifth, when the Torah speaks of paying one-fifth above the principal, it's called the one-fifth from external one-fifth. There's a point we've discussed before that what you do is you take the principal, you divide it into four equal parts, and then you add on that amount and that becomes the fifth. So if you have $100, the fifth is $25 as opposed to $20. You don't take a fifth of the 100, you take the 100 divided by four and then add on a fifth part. Okay. And they confess their sin that they made. And they bring this asham, birosho. Meaning to say that Raj says, this is the principle which she swore about. The principle is called the head. Because it's the source of the prophet, which stems from it. The safe love. And then he adds on one fifth, and he gives it to the person whom he whom he was guilty against. And if and if the man does not have a redeemer, if the man does not have a redeemer to, uh, to return the debt, then then the, the, the debt is returned to Hashem, to the Kohen. Aside from the Ram of atonement, which he shall provide for atonement. Let's see what Rashi says this pasuk means. A little opaque, ambiguous. The person who made him take an oath, the guy says, you stole from me. And he has no heirs. And he has no heirs. So we're talking about a situation so where the person who made the claim has died and now the guy wants to return the money. How does he do it? So we're talking about a case where a person denied it and now he, he changed his mind. He confessed about his sin. Is there anybody amongst Jewish people who doesn't have a redeemer? O Ben, O Bas, O Shar, Basar, Akarov, Mishpacha, Safiv, or he has some other relative, then Mawa Yaakov, he can go back even five or six or seven or eight generations. Now, is that Gershom Mace for Eli Yoshim? This refers to a convert who dies and who has no heirs. So, Ashav Amusham, Zakarim Vachomesh, this is the principal and the one fifth. So, who do you give it to? You give it to Hashem for the Kohen. Kanao Hashem. When the son of a Kohen, God takes it and gives it to the Kohen, Shiva Oso Mishmar. So which Kohen gets it? 
Well, the guy comes forward and there are 24 watches of the Kohanim. So you give it to one of those uh, Kohanim who was there or during that watch, he gets the windfall. The Vadial Kippur, aside from the atonement offering, Hamor Aside from the atonement offering, which is spoken of in Vayikra, which he needs to bring. And anything that is a truma or any, we'll see what this word truma means, from all the sacrifices of the children of Israel goes to the Kohen. What is this verse referring to? I'm a Rabbi Yishmael, People don't bring a truma offering to the Kohen. It, usually the word truma means a sacrifice, uh, the tithe that you give to the Kohen, not a sacrifice. Isn't it the Kohen who goes to it and gets it from the threshing floor? The person doesn't have to bring it to the Kohen. What does it mean that it's the one who he off, makes an offering to the Kohen? This is referring, this verse is referring to the first fruits. As it says, It says, you shall bring it to the house of Hashem. But I don't know. What's to be done with these verses? Says the verse, La Kohen will yet, for the Kohen shall be his. So this verse is telling us to give the first fruits to the Kohen. The ish is called the will yet, and a man's holy shall be his. Whatever a man gives to the Kohen, it shall be his. What does this mean? So the Gemara explains, Lafisha never matanos kuhuno via. Since the gifts to the Kohanim and the Levim were already stated, I might think you could take the, the Kohen and the Levi could come and take the tithes and forcibly take them. So there's the verse, Isha's Kodeshav, well, yeah. He has the right to give out this gift. He has the right to give to everyone. So the goodwill, the benefit of the gift belongs to the owner. He gets to decide. This is like a person. You know what this is like? It's like a person who's on a foundation board who gets to decide where to give the charitable funds of the foundation. He has to give them to charity, but he gets to pick the charity. You can't for it. Let's say the charity says, we say we're going to give this. This mission is to give it to poor people. Well, a poor person can't come and say, I demand it. The foundation has to say, we're going to give it to you. So that's a, that's a, a right, a perk. The person, the foundation, they take him out to lunch. They wine and dine him. They, they schmooze him up. All of a sudden, they laugh at his jokes. So this is the, uh, this is the, the right. That's called the tova sana, the goodwill to be gained by giving out these gifts. We all know that it's a very big perk to be able to give out a gift. So therefore, you're going to give it to the Kohen who visits you when you're, when you're in need of help, who promises to make a Misha Beirach for you, comes to study Mishnayos in your in your kitchen, that's the person you're going to give it to. And so that's the idea. Old Midrash, he says, Old Midrashim Harbei Dar Shuba. And so there are many other Midrashim on this verse, but it's a frame. Midrash Agada. Midrash Agada says, The Midrash says, The man and his holy shall belong to him. Misha Me'akev Master Osav, the Eno Nos Nan. Lo you are maestros. Sof, shein oseu sadeu ose ala echame asara, shai salamudo asos. So Rashi says, the Midrash says, the man's tithes will belong to him, means to say, if a person is sinful and doesn't give his tithes, in the end, his field will just produce one tenth of what it was supposed to. The tithes will be to him. Okay, and now we're up to the verse, which we just spent seven weeks studying the passage of the Sota. God spoke to Moses. Okay, wait, I, wait, I, I skipped to Rashi. Another interpretation is the man will give to the coin and to him will be a lot of money. Okay. 
If there will be a man whose wife will be go astray, and she will trespass against him. So this is the sin of the Soto woman. Right? She says, what are we talking about? The previous verse says, a man's holy offering shall be his. God promises you, Rav, she says, if you don't give the gifts to the Kohen, I promise you what's going to happen is you're going to need the Kohen's help because your wife is going to be a sota and you're going to have to bring her to him and to give her the bitter, bitter waters to drink. So the bottom line is, if you think I don't need this Kohen, you're going to end up needing the Kohen. You gave a, a, a look, Ben. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand it. So is it, I'm, I think I'm reading it. In verse 14, it says there's two possibilities. And you need the Kohen to figure out whether this was, without, without witnesses, this was jealousy that was legitimate jealousy based on a real cause, or it was paranoid jealousy. So the, is, we'll see there's two possibilities, but even if, it's not paranoid. It's not paranoid jealousy. She was secluded after the husband warned her not to be secluded with this man. So she did do something wrong. And but the point is, nobody wants to go through this process of having to bring this man, having to bring her to the coin. So if you don't give your tithes, you think you don't need the coin, you're going to end up needing it. And if imagine for the man, the man up until now is all the power. Suddenly, he has, to, uh, he has to relinquish his power and go to the Kohen. It's not a pleasant feeling for the man who was all powerful until now. It's pretty presumptive, Rashi, to think that he's he warning you that if you don't give your tithe, you, wife, you, your wife's going to become a sota. Like, it seems like that's a pretty far reach. Why? I mean, I understand the importance of highlighting the Kohen and needing the Kohen and wanting the Kohen in your back pocket, I guess, so to speak. But... It seems like a big jump to go from giving your tithe to your wife's going to be a sofa. Well, it's a classic uh, Rashi. Rashi very, very often will, will try to explain the proximity of the passages in the Torah one to the other. So Rashi will often say that one leads to the next. So since the previous passage talked about not tithing, that's how you ended up with the sota. Uh -huh. Maybe it's not even a, an oath. It's just... Um, this person obviously is too stingy to share. So th those kind of people also have problems of jealousy and problems of control and problems of, you know, I'm the, the king of the world. And of course your wife uh, will, will react to such behavior. Like, uh, so, we, so just, that, it's we just read about Elimelech and Naomi, right? That, that's exactly what Elimelech did, right? He ran away when everybody needed his help. And guess what? <laughs> your, your wife is, is the only one left from this whole family, right? So, But it's interesting that Rashi does not say that. That'll be a psychological reaction to not tithing as your family will say you're stingy and she'll go to somebody else who's more generous. Rashi says it's a punishment that, that you're going to need it. But uh, I hear your explanation, but... but um, it is interesting. Rashi is saying it's a divine punishment. Okay, let's go on. Ish, ish. So why is the word ish repeated here? So the Talmud tells us, that she trespasses against two. That the woman has sinned by sinning in this manner. She sinned against two ishes. The God, who is called the man of war, and her husband, who is below. So Ish, God is also called Ish. Ki testesh, though, Shan Rabbo, Seinu, our rabbis taught, Ein amena afin, no afin, ancha tikanes ben ruach shtus. Why is the sota called teste? Because the word teste is spelled like the word shh. Sh. It sounds like the word, it sounds and it's spelled like the word shtut, which is nonsense or foolishness. So the adulterers only commit adultery when they get this spirit of foolishness inside them. As it states, ki tishte the kasuvbo and ki tishte. It would normally be 
Ki Tisteh, but it's spelled just like Tisteh. So therefore, what? No, Shtut, Rashi saying, as here as nonsense, nonsense. Right, but also, it seems really really stoked. 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 Stoked is great. Hold on. Yeah, but that is, hold on. Is that with a tough instead of a tough? Yeah, that's that's not that's that's with a tough, and this is with a tet, so it's a different word. Because Subo noev isha chasarev, a woman who is adulterous is lacking heart. Shuto shamakra, and the literal verse means kitiste kemoste meola kitiste teit mitarkeit smiut. That literally means it's like somebody who departs from the path of modesty and she becomes suspect in her husband's eyes. She commits a trespass against him. We accuse her of sleeping with another man. She says, we, we accuse her of having lain with another man. And this was hidden from the eyes of her husband. And she's secluded and defiled. And therefore, there is no witness against her. And she had not been seized. Meaning it was not done against her will. It was not done against her will. So a man lies with her and is and departed from the eyes of her husband, and she's secluded with him, and there's no witness. Okay, let's see what Rahul she says. With Shachav Ish Prat Lakatan. It's exclusion of adultery with a minor, Misha Eno Ish, or somebody who's not a man. So if she was secluded with an animal, we can't make her drink the bitter waters or with a minor. Meaning to say, if she sleeps with another man, she's disqualified to be with her husband. But if while she's married to her husband, her sister has an adulterous relationship with her husband, which is a curious penalty, that doesn't prohibit her from pro prohibit the woman A from being with her husband anymore. Raj, the Tanhuma gives an example of this, but we will um, you want me to read this midrash? So there was an incident involving two sisters who resembled each other. One of them was married and lived in one town, the other was married and lived in another town. The husband of one of them wanted to warn her against secluding herself with another man and to have her drink the bitter waters in Jerusalem. She went to the town where her married sister lived. Her sister said to her, why did you come here? She answered, my husband wants me to have me drink the bitter waters. The sister said, I'll go and drink instead of you. She answered, go. Her sister put on her clothes and went instead of her. She drank the bitter waters, was found innocent, and went back to her sister's home. Her sister went out to greet her joyfully. She hugged her and kissed her. When they kissed, the sister was suspected by her husband, smelled the bitter waters, and died immediately in fulfillment of that which it says, man is not in control of the wind to be able to confine the wind, and he has no authority on the day of death. So basically, the woman just smelled the bitter waters. She had tried to elude the bitter waters, but they caught her. <laughs> That's a great midrash. Okay, so then, v'nawa me'neisha pra osuma. It excludes a blind man. If he had seen his wife committing the sin and he pr pretended that he didn't know this so that he hoped that the bitter waters, that she will die from the bitter waters then the bitter waters won't work. They only work if he doesn't know the truth. She secluded. She or how long does she have to be secluded? Well, the amount of time it takes 
uh, for the impurity of adulterous relations. The aid ain't ba. I'm Yeshba. If there's a witness, excuse me, a few aid echad, even one witness, Shamar Nitmes, who says she was defiled, she would not drink the bitter waters. The aid ain't ba, but tuma. There's no witness there with respect to defilement of a yesh Aden with stira. So there's no witness that says she actually committed the adultery, but there is a but there is witnesses that she was secluded, secluded. The Ilonitfasa, she had not been seized and it's not forced. So she had so basically the law of the Sota, she went willingly and secluded herself after her husband had warned her not to be secluded with another man. This is what we just spent seven weeks studying through the um, through the story of. Tractate Sota. According to the Gemara, he has to specify which man, right? According to the Gemara, no. If you if you warn her about one man, but then she gets secluded with another man, she still drinks the bitter waters. Okay, right. That's why I remember the Gemara. We could check it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dan, we cut you off. That's what I'm this exact same question. I think that that's what the Gemara says. Once you warn her against one man, then she's warned against being secluded with every man. I believe that's what the Gemara says, but Check me, Rabbi Yosef. Google me. My memory is terrible, so I, I, I thought I remember that Gemara, the very beginning of the Sota. So Seems check like it. the punishments uh, for having a witness are significantly higher 